Everybody, welcome back to Soul School. And as promised, we have a salute to the one and only Rick James out of Buffalo, New York. And for this special, we got one of his drummers, a brother by the name of Larry Durrell. Larry, 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 Larry. It's a trip. I'm not going to tell you guys what happened last night. Last night was just kind of crazy. <laughs> Last night was crazy, but we sitting up here with an official member of the Stone City Band. And, uh, <laughs> I have to bust my own self out. Cause last night, it's an inside thing. It was just so, so crazy. I was wishing that my man was here last night. I thought he was here last night. And I, I'm not, I, not going to bore you guys with the deep, details, but uh, <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to the show, Larry. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Honor to be here. Now, I know you play drums, but uh, how long have you been, actually been in the drums before you actually got with Rick? Um, I've been playing drums since I was four. Uh, I'm about to be 44, so I've been playing that long. I started playing professionally uh, when I was 10. And you're out of? I'm out of St. Louis. St. Louis, Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. Home of Jesse Johnson, Ike Turner, all kinds of different people. All the people, all, the, all of them. Yeah, definitely. No, actually, who, who are some of the cats that actually inspired you to actually kind of get you to where you are now? Uh, Yogi Horton is definitely one of them. Um, I used to just, man, be fascinated watching him play. You know, he's with Ashford and Simpson. He was with, oh, man. Just everybody, <laughs> Rob James, he was just, he was the one, you know, and um, then he started doing Luther, and uh, it was just the way he held down everything, his charisma, the way he played, and then um, I had Dana Davis for gospel, because my first gospel gig, you know, first gig period was uh, playing for the Clark Sisters, so I saw so many drummers, you know, from, from Detroit, Michigan, you know, so Dana Davis was playing for the Winans, you know, and I had Joel Smith, he was with the Hawkins family, and that's where my pops came from, you know, he was from the Hawkins family, so between all those, you know, those drummers in, you know, as it progressed, you know, Steve Gadd and, and all the rest of the cast, Dave Recco, and when you get to see those cats and you see them, you know, do their chops and everything, just make you expand and step up your game, so those are the guys that I learned it from. Yeah, Yogi Horton, that's the guy that actually played on a lot of the moment stuff, you know, Love on a Two-Way Street, yes. Come On Sexy Mommy, Yogi Horton is bad. Yes. All you Luther Vandross fans, that's him on Superstar. Yes. Uh, uh, we could get all that. Let's get back to Rick James. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you end up getting with Tricky Rick James? Man, it was uh, it was crazy. I was on a uh, tour with uh, Alex Bunyan, Norman Brown, and Chris Bode. Uh We were actually doing a Christmas tour that year, and we were in the middle of sound check. I, I believe it was like in... Um, Mm, Albuquerque, New Mexico, I think that's somewhere around there. And uh, I got a phone call right, right in the middle of sound check. And uh, someone uh, asked me, you know, is this Larry Durrell? I said, yes. And he said, uh, uh, you came highly recommended, uh, you know, we're, we're Rick James' organization. And I, I laughed. I was like, you went, dun, 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 Rick James. <laughs> he started laughing. Like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, I'm in the middle of sound check, right? Uh, can you call me back? Now I'm telling everybody, Alex, I'm telling Norman, I'm telling everybody, somebody just called me about Rick James. And he's like, for real? I said, yeah, I, I don't think it's for real, though. Called me at the sound check. It was real. And um, he said, uh, are you available that January? I said, yes, I'll be there. And then I didn't hear from him anymore. So I didn't think it was real. Then they called me, said, sound, you know, they said, uh, rehearsals start Monday. Okay. <laughs> uh, got there. Uh, Doug Grisby is the one who recommended me. He ended up, he was the MD at that time and uh, recommended recommend me for the gig. I went through a rehearsal, learned a gang of songs for the show. I think it was like a two and a half hour show. It was simple but complex at the same time. Everybody had their lane. You know, I learned the horn section had their lane. All the keyboards, even though it was two keyboard players, they had their lane. Bass, guitar, drums had their lane. Percussion had their lane. If you stepped out your lane, it was a train wreck. And he knew when you did it. He could be in the middle of that song, but if you saw him whip his head, turn around, you knew like, uh-oh, <laughs> somebody came on track because he knew it was just simple. If, it's, if everybody, you know, it's, it, every, everyone would jump in it and, and try to play, you know, Super Freak. Everyone would try to play Give It To Me Baby, but it was the way it was done. It's da 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 Me, I had to hold it down, hold that groove. He told me if, if I didn't make them dance, I wasn't playing. 
and he was right. And when it was time for us to shine, he would leave and let you shine because he loved instrumentation. I mean, everything. We, we had everything from, we even did Bach. You know, we had classical in the show. We went to, you know, jazz in the show. We had rock in the show. We had straight funk R&B in the show. We even did some country and western in the show. I mean, he didn't, he loved music and he put it all in the show. It was amazing. Because when you start thinking about the players like Tom McDermott, Oscar Olsen, Lanise Hughes, um, we, 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 yeah, Lannis Hughes, um, Levi Ruffin, who is one of my favorite keyboard players of all time, I felt from come and get it, busting out of L7 Square in that particular time period that Rick clearly took the funk from Clinton in that camp and became the number one guy and wouldn't surrender that spot. And you're talking about a guy who survived during the Prince era and the Michael Jackson thriller era and kept the doors of Motown open um, for that particular time, you know, for really kept Motown from closing, from going bankrupt, you know, really, yeah. We got all seven of the Temptations together and I think that you know, I'm going to let you elaborate on this point, but I think that people don't really give him the respect, and not to mention girl groups. He did that better than James Brown. He did it better than Clinton. He did it better than Prince. The Mary Jane girls, his baby was better than anything that any of them cats did. Your thoughts? I agree with that. Um, I am the, the Mary Jane girls now, uh, featuring Val Young. And I work with Candy. I, I work with all the girls, everyone but JoJo. But I have, I, I, I've had all the girls... Uh, before he passed away and since he's passed away uh, as far as the, the band and the structure and how he just orchestrated everything like from Stone City Band and how he like basically can get on drums show you what he, what he wanted on drums strap on the bass play the bass show you what he wants on bass put on a guitar and play guitar and show you what he wants on guitar. Then turn around and sit on the keyboard and play everything. Everyone just looks at Prince as doing that. No, Rick did that too, you know. You left out another point. He was a bad percussion player. Yes, he was. <laughs> you forgot you were a drummer. How you forget that? No, because I, I, I guess because I used to sit him down. <laughs> Rick was, Rick, Rick was bad, y'all. Rick was bad. He played kungas. He he played tambourine. He could play the the, you know, the heck out of a cowbell. I mean, he played everything. He really did. Timbales, you know, he would he would move our percussion out the way. He would go back there. He started doing his thing. I mean, he played everything, man. And as far as arranging and writing, you know, it was just to watch him. It was a thrill just to sit and watch him, you know, because he would sit there with the music in his head. And you'd hear him humming, and next thing you know, he could tell you if it's gonna be funky, if it's gonna be a ballad. You know, if he was if it was really going to be funky because his head started moving and then he just started like he'll tell you you know four on the floor four on the floor okay we four on the floor and he'll just start going from there it just build it just build and once it build you just you see a movie everything he taught me was like from from the intro all the way to the end he said set up the intro like it's a movie you know have people wondering what's about to happen next because at the very beginning, with the credits, before the credits start, you hear this, you hear the movie, you know, you hear the music, it starts big, it starts small, and it gets bigger, it gets bigger, to the point now you're looking like, okay, what's about to happen? And that's how his shows always did. And it, in the middle, it was always excitement, always. When it, when it was a ballad, he wanted to be beautiful, he wanted to touch someone, and he wanted them to think about, you know, whoever it was at that time. You know, he told us that, you know. He said when it's time for the funk, he said, I want them to dance. I want them to have a good time. He said it's a party. You know, he said he just want everybody to just fellowship and have a great time. You know, and that's how he thought of it. And that's, that was his whole concept for the Stone City Band at that time. When it came to Mary Jane Girls, he groomed them. He catered the music to the, what they could do as far as movement, you know, vocally, and, and to get across what he was trying to get message-wise through them. Even when it came to Tina, you know, and he was working with Tina, you know, you still heard his music, but he let her come out through the music and he, he just, he, all he did was just intensify it, just put, you know, just put the icing on the cake and he put a stamp on it. He, he was just a genius. You know, he was just, he was just a genius. Hey everybody, welcome back to Soul School. Salute to the one and only Rick James with brother Larry, his former drummer, and Tina Marie's drummer to the day that she passed. That's a whole nother story. Um, where were you when uh, Tina Marie passed, if I may ask? Um, I was actually at church. I a huge fan of hers, and I've always thought that the guys from Ozone, Paul Hines, Alan McGreer on bass, and those dudes were 
the true definition of that show, Unsung, Ozone, all the way from the stuff. Then when she first started really producing herself, like I Need Your Love and You Make Love, like Springtime, Tune In Tomorrow, that band. I would have loved to have been at Square Biz. Could you imagine being at the rehearsal for Square Biz with her back conducting the band and let's go through that change again with them drums and stuff? Mm-hmm. Just crazy, man. Mm-hmm. She was, um, I have to say she was amazing as well. Um, she knew everything. You know, you could tell Rick groomed her. I say Rick, Rick, Rick really did groom her, but then she just took it to another level of her own. And she knew everything, beat for beat, you know, note for note. Baseline. She would she would play the baseline on her guitar. You know, she was always with her guitar. She always had a guitar, even though, even though you know she, you know she would go out. She would you know perform and you know with without any instrument at, at all. But she can just go all the way full out. We're saying goodbye to uh, one of the baddest female guitar players of all time. Her name is Kat. She used to be on the Magic Johnson show, played with Prince, everybody. Oh, oh girl, well, I met her, ironically, I was at Dennis Chambers' booth in 1994, right here at the NAMM show. Mm, it's a, <laughs> I know you're a guitar player. She don't, oh, she don't know Dennis Chambers. Y'all know she lying. And Dougal Ch- <laughs> Dennis Ch- uh, was at Dennis's booth. Bruce Carter, a pleasure was around. George Duke had just walked by. Um, and Dougal Chance, it was a bunch of us, but I knew she was gonna get picked up. This girl is sick. I don't know if y'all can see her. Scoot over a little bit. This, 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 this girl is sick. <laughs> Sick, discovered by Sheila. Well, not discovered by Sheila. She just happened to get a look at her, and uh, the rest is history. Thank you so much, and you're too kind. But why you got to say what year it was? <laughs> <laughs> because we want people to know that you ain't just some fly by night, some some old somebody who just hasn't put in no work. And I absolutely appreciate you. And you know, as long as they are ears, that's why we do what we do. People love the music. We do the music. That's it. That's it. Now, real quick before we get back to our Rick James tribute, I was just messing with her about I'm putting her on Front Street that she got to put out a project. She does side musician work real, real well. This girl is, will never be out of work, but I've been begging her just on the inside, please put out a project. Because if you've ever seen this girl play, she's insane. Inversions, all of that stuff that you see guys like Dwayne Blackbird, McKnight, or Larry Call, whoever, she can do everything that every... And being a female musician, that's big. Well, I learned from them, you know. I learned from the best. I just watch, and I'm just trying to hang in. But working on something. You took it to another level. It's like somebody studying Buster Williams or Billy Cobham or something, because I hear so much stuff out of you. It's actually insane. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, but I'm going to let you guys get back to your thing. Let's get back to our Rick James tribute, (laughs) and uh, (laughs) we'll be back with Larry. Hey, everybody. Just excited just full of energy doing a tribute to Rick James and uh, just got a real blessing on camera that's a whole nother story whole nother story um, if there was something that you would want people to take away uh, with Rick James even though you said pretty much everything that there was to say about this bad brother um, if there's something that we don't know that you would want us all to know me included um, about Rick because you were on the inside you were there to the day he was gone also before they took him to Forest Lawn what would you want us all to know I would want everyone to know um it's not all about the, everyone thinks about the drugs when they think about Rick. Uh, they think about drugs, they think about um, Rick James, B, all of that. Um, beyond all that stuff, um, he was a great entertainer. Uh, he was a great friend. And um, he loved his band, he loved people. He, you know, when, whoever came to the show, they always, he would greet them, he would have a great time. Of course, he was a ladies man, but you know, all, all in all, he was just a great guy to be around. Um, definitely family orientated, you know, even when it came to like just having little pool parties. And I remember when my kids would come and he just took them in as, as his own. He had a little section for the kids and he had this section for the adults and, and everybody just had a great time. And when he came on being on the road, we were family. That's all he kept looking at and thinking of it, that we were family. Now, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh a friend of his is here, and if we don't get up out of here, um, she's going to whoop us both up. And she's already probably ticked at me from last night, so we're going to end this real quick. <laughs> uh, a final thought before we take it back. Quick thought. I would just like everybody to continue to play his music. Keep the love alive in Rick James, because he loved you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>